Okay, here we go, over to the CAD bit. Now, I wanted to do an extended element of this, and I first did a, an initial trial, and my wife heard it, and she said, my God, you go on forever. Um, so that kind of gave me the indication that I was a little bit, little bit long, maybe. Um, the reason was because, well, I realized that it wasn't about drawing little pictures. I mean, these are kind of little cool little things that I did, um, and they're, they're really sketches because they're not perfectly the same as, you know, it's not an actual model of the real thing. It's just representations of it. Um, and they're fun to look at, yep. But the most important part of CAD, which is far beyond just doing a diagram, is that you are positioning it in three dimensions in the real world. What I mean by that is, I mean, because obviously this is a bit of a grey kind of little world here, is that um, it's not 2D plus another dimension. That is not what CAD is. Most people think that, oh wow, you can actually draw it so that you've got full perspective from wherever you go, etc, etc. That's cool and is definitely useful so that you can rotate it and look over it and everything else. But you could probably then go to the top view, the front view, the right view, and you'd get all the elements. That isn't what CAD's really about. Those um those particular views, while interesting, don't give you the full capability. And I wanted to give you an understanding of why people use CAD in a decision making effort, in a way for you to decide how things are going to be built, not just I'm going to construct it with this form. It's design is about three things for me. Safety it's about um, sorry, I had a mental blank there. It's about safety. It's about function, and then it's about aesthetic appeal, and all of those are part of design. Now, design is, without getting into the academic levels of it, it's really about making decisions that are going to achieve those three things. So I'll show you how that was done. So the decision-making process is what I really want to illustrate here. So first of all, when you go to make something. You kind of go like this. Okay, let's go put this damn thing together. And you say something really simple like um, a table you put in your uh, living room floor. Now imagine this. How big is the damn thing going to be? How high is the damn thing going to be? How thick is the the uh, um, the main you know horizontal surface going to be? What is it going to weigh? What is it going to be made of? All those elements, you end up going, well, I could do whatever I want. Hang on. No, I can't do whatever I want. I have to do something that's a little bit more functional. I have to walk around the damn thing. It has to get through doorways. It has to actually be something I can carry without having eight guys coming in to move it around. These are called design constraints. So with that, we'll start with the elements of design constraints. So the crucible that you saw before. Uh, so Basically what I did is I measured it literally with a set of calipers and I came into probably within about half a millimeter accuracy but this is a reasonably good representation and I did that with uh, rail sweeps if you want to get uh, technical about how I did it. Um, so this allowed me to do this. There was two crucial components which was the placement of the burner, where am I going to put the damn thing to heat it correctly and what size of uh, furnace I'm going to make and how thick it was, all those things like that. Sizing and function first. So as a prelude to it, as I said in the previous video, this is going to be a little hot beast. Um, I want it to be able to be capable of going to 1650 if I want to. Reality is I probably won't take it above 1300 ever. Um, there is some stuff I want to do with glass later on that this is why I want to do that. Um, so that's why I'm getting these components. They are the fuel, which is the oil, which is uh, reusable, you know, kitchen oil, reusable, recyclable, you know, uh, from fryers. This is LP gas, liquid petroleum gas, which is used to light the burner, and this is compressed air, like my little toy compressor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it took me about five seconds, and you can tell, huh? Um, that feeds in to create the 
siphoning effect for the oil to create the spray which is the really high high burning uh, fuel. The reason why the oil burns so much better is because of the liquid. There's just physically more material to oxidize and then create an exothermic reaction with. Gas is a gas, it's very thin. Um, so the amount of molecules that you're actually burning is far far less than the oil. That's effectively why it's so hot. Not only that, it's a long chain of carbohydrate compared to a really tiny chain which is one or two um, carbons. So therefore this burns so much hotter than uh, the um, LP. It can get up to 1800 degrees with that. I can I can do steel forging with that if I really wanted to with that fuel. The um, So let's get right into it shall we? Okay, the burner. So we'll just bring that up. Alright. So I kind of borrowed some design elements from other people who have designed them. So some from professional uh, burner head designers, some from just people who have tried it themselves. I'm using parts from the United States because in Australia we kind of don't get cold enough to use waste oil burners. Um, they, I mean here we don't get below zero so heating is not that important we use and also uh, natural gas in Victoria where I live in Australia is incredibly cheap so we just burn that and it's all done um, and that, I, I can tell you now buying stuff in the United States using what's called NPT which is national pipe thread means all the fittings have to come from the US as well and oh man it was a lot of trouble but they're all on their way and I've got all the pieces I need the outer casing which will have forced air through basically what is a vacuum clean motor. Uh, is I, I bought locally in for a place, I'll give them a plug now, which is uh, Metfab, Metal Fabrication Place, uh, down in Burwood. And they're really good, pretty good prices, kind of average, um, but they do a great job and I can you know ask them to cut the tiniest little thing for a dollar fifty and they'll do it, which I love. Um, and I can get all the anything I want there. It's really good. So I pulled out. These are all just mild hot rolled steel. Uh, if you know one of the difference between hot rolled and cold rolled, uh, look it up on Wikipedia. The it's basically just average mild steel. I'll just go to the front view. The placement of the burner is crucial. Absolutely crucial. So when doing glass uh, smelting, the furnace can heat the crucible to ridiculously high temperatures and what that will do is it'll cause it to collapse eventually as in within about four or five smelts so it's not a lot um, and you don't want that damn thing breaking on you when you got molten glass in there the element is that you can't spot heat it you can't heat this spot more than the rest of it you have to heat the whole thing and so the concept is that if you go look at the top the flame comes in and goes all the way around, all the way up, and out the top. Now the truth of the matter is, the flame gets from here, goes all the way around to about here, and most of it goes to here, and then about so about 80% goes to about here, and then the last little bit goes to here. The rest of it is hot air, going around like that, and that's really what you want. So, I originally positioned it low, and what I had to do was actually position it higher than that. Uh, because I consulted engineers where I bought my refractory and they said no 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 you have to put it basically at the same line as a plinth that's called a plinth don't ask me why and the base of the crucible so that's what I did uh, I put it a little bit lower later on I made a correction for that so this is where the three levels uh, the two gases and the oxidative states uh, of material like the air the compressed air to help this burn. Actually the compressed air doesn't help that burn, that just pretty much sprays it. Um, what causes the burn is the stuff coming in from the vacuum cleaner motor, which is just um, just air that you'd get out of the vacuum cleaner hose when you put it on backwards. Now, as I said, it goes all the way around, so therefore what cavity do I have for this? So that's where I went. Ta-da! Here it is, this is the inside of the furnace. Now that gives you a couple of things, clearance and the ability to get tongs in around it to pick up the damn thing. 
Uh, and if you've ever cast one too tight, you are swearing at the damn thing for the entire duration of its life. Um, I have done that before. And, yeah, lots of F-words at it. The, as you can see, you also, and this is the element of CAD, you can see what it looks like. You can see, there's my little logo in the way, sorry about that. Um, you can kind of get a feel for how much room is in there. And there are times when you'll go, hmm, you know what, that's kind of tight. I didn't think it was. According to the measurements, I'm okay, but when I look at it like this, it's it's not going to work. That is one of the crucial elements of CAD, where you actually rethink a whole technical element. You'll do calculations, you'll do two-dimensional diagrams, you'll do all sorts of things, and then you'll say, meh, that ain't going to work too well. It really isn't. There's another time in this where I, I'll show you in the design process that I did that. So, not to go on for too long, like my dear wife tells me, um, I'll show you the lid. Now, the lid is a little different, and I'll go to a different view here. Ghosted. Right. So traditionally, these damn things are done with just a hole, not even a plug, and that's the exhaust. It all goes up and out. But the reason I did this was, hang on a sec, was because I didn't want to disturb the metal. Every time you make a ripple or a current inside the metal, it absorbs um, gases from the outside on its surface, and that just causes porosity later uh, and weaknesses within the metal. This, the operations that I do are highly well structured. I don't produce garbage um, just because I don't have a very very large business doesn't mean I don't produce very very good work. So. It was very important for me to do that. The if you get the um, induction furnaces, which are electric, they will have like robotic arms placing in ingots very slowly, like fingers, kind of dropping them in. But and they get to the very edge of the metal with it holding the very edge of the ingot, and then they let go. And it's a very slight, uh, buoyant kind of sink. There's a reason for that. They don't want to disturb the surface of the metal. Um, so, with the gases going around here, and I'm having compressed air and everything else like that, there'll be a lot of turbulence coming up the top. So what I did is something unusual is, and because I can use CAD, I created an organic shape for the exhaust. And yes, this exhaust hole is larger than the burner. Uh, it changes slightly, I modified it a little bit, it's, I made it a bit bigger. This minute it goes round and round and round and up. I also positioned it, I had it at one stage out here, and then realised Damn it, I can't see the burner head. I want to be able to see the flame. So that's something I can go, well, can I see this? Can I look down there and see a little bit of color? Yeah, I want to know if I'm burning yellow or blue. And I also put the hole in the top because I want to charge it. Now, one of the things I did is I made this straight originally. And then as I started working through my workflow, I started working through the whole, how am I going to use this? I realized I'm going to put that back in there. Then I'm going to, I'm going to turn it off. I'm going to cool it down. Oh, damn it. If I cool this down and there are straight sides, it's going to shrink, grip onto that um, little plug, and I will not be able to get it out until it's uh, decently hot again. So that conical shape means that if I place it on top, if it squeezes, it's going to push the plug up, not onto it. I'm hoping on that, by the way. It may still squeeze it, so we'll see. I'll do some shaving on the damn thing if I need to with, um, I don't know, probably a file, actually. Probably a really rough file. The yes, so that's the basic design, and I thought, yep, I'm pretty happy with that. Uh, so next point, boom, back to that. Uh, where am I? The crucible. So here I went, yep, I'm going to design it around this, and then it occurred to me that how much metal am I going to get out of this? You know, if I want to do something really kind of big, um, and I want to do something that is a large part in aluminium or brass, what am I going to do? Am I just going to stay with that? So, another thing a CAD, you can find out the exact volume. There's a little button that allows me to find out exactly the volume of that shape, which is basically the inside uh, element of this, just coming to that line there. That's 2.5 litres. 
the good thing about that was, okay, 2.5 litres, how much does that weigh? For aluminium, I think it was around 5 kilos. For brass, I think it was like 9 kilos. So I thought, what's the chances of me making a brass part heavier than 9 kilos? And I thought, yeah, I probably will. Damn it. God damn it. I was wrong on my constraints. So I looked at my crucible calendar. Calendar? Catalog. Yeah, I knew it was a C word. Um, and I went, okay, come on, Mr. Morgan, tell me what uh, crucible I should have. And I found this one, which is basically that one <laughs> with the uh, sizing tool, the scalar tool here. Right, this is this is the scaling tool. So I just scaled it up because it's fairly much the same shape, just larger. Uh, got the exact dimensions on the top and um, scaled the top and bottom as well, and it turned out to be about that. So that gave me, bang, 4.8 liters. See what I'm doing here is nothing to do with the actual physical drawing of the item. I'm using CAD to allow me to make design design decisions. And this is what's really cool. It allows you to think and kind of war game out everything perfectly before you've even done anything. You do your screw-ups in 3D before you do the screw-ups in reality. And I really like that. It saves me a lot of money and wasted material and scrap. Um, and also, I don't feel as stupid when I've spent four weeks building something and I have to destroy it because it was wrong. So, at that point, see for example here. 4.8 litres. Is that enough? Hmm. Now in aluminium, um, that was about 10 kilos, and in brass it was like 20 kilos. So at this point I realised, I don't think I can lift more than 20 kilos in the, on the tongs, especially with liquid metal, and I'm not going to be able to tilt this on its side. It's going to have to be straight up. Jesus, that's going to be high. Um, okay, yeah, that's definitely going to be it. So I'm going to design it for this, but make it capable of using that. Yep, great. I've, re I've adjusted my constraints. So, next point. What do we make the damn thing out of? Brick, which is the cheapest thing possible because I don't like spending money where I don't have to. Uh, and then the first thing I realize is, wow, that's one big fat donut. Look at that thing. Um, and then on top of that is, geez, I'm going to have to cut it. and Oh, geez. You know how hard uh, sil silicate alumina brick is? It is harder than a rock. I mean, you grab a rock, it's more like granite. It's ridiculously hard. And I thought, mm, hiring a saw from my usual place, as in like uh, Bunnings, the equivalent of Harbour Freight in the United States, is not going to be going to be able to get through that. So I consulted some refractory engineers, and they said, no, 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 that, that's the old way of doing it. Um, which makes sense, because I last used a furnace about 20 years ago now, almost. Uh, 15, I think. And they said, no, 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 you do a hot cast on the inside, you get a really light refractory brick, it's more like pumice stone on the outside to take the medium heat, and then you insulate that with uh, wool, ceramic fiber wool. And I went, great, they gave me the minimum requirements, and I built this. So I thought, yeah, that's, that's a lot more kind of manageable size-wise, a little bit more like my original. So I then went, I'd like a little bit of a thicker hot face because if I want to take it to 1650 degrees Celsius, um, which is about 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit, yeah, I'd want a little bit more. So I did. And I came up with this design. Um, so this is still with brick and still with my f my little lid with the exhaust. You can see down there. Hello. See? What a cool little thing there. I can actually see my burner head, which is great. Um, and then it allowed me to kind of wargame what that's about. So let me see if I can just uh, have a look what's inside the lid. There we go. And I'll just bring it back to the previous one there. That's much better. So this pole here represents the size of the wool. It allows me to know, is this going to be high enough? Um, yep. See, that's a visual cue. I can do, uh, use my measurement tools like this but I forget to look at that sort of thing because it's tiny whereas this damn thing here it's pretty much telling me that's too big or that's too small 
and that really helps with uh, just thinking freely and letting the muse take over to allow me to create something good. So these are the hot face made of uh, castable and this section is also a castable. When I say castable it's it's a mixture of calcium aluminate cement and a whole lot of other goodies that make it workable. Calcium aluminate cement is really hard to work with. It's a pain in the ass. I've already done it and oh, I'm not doing that again. Um, give you an example. I was putting in water with a spray bottle because it was that sensitive to over wetting. Like, tss, 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 you know, it's just stupid. Um, so these are pre made in bags with all the goodies, deflocculants and um, Montmorillonite clays, and all sorts of stuff that make it really easy for the average mug like myself to do something good. good. Over here, obviously, is the wool, the white bit. Wait, that one? Yep. Uh, 250, no, 25 mils, so about an inch. And then I realized, as I'm looking at it, okay, you know, fire's coming out of here, uh, oil's being sprayed, and then I realized, wait, oil's being sprayed. Hang on a sec. We're going to have oil sprayed onto the actual refractory. That's going to destroy it. So I talked to my refractory guys, and they said, oh yeah, yep, it'll completely eat through it eventually. Like, and I meant eventually, like, not very you know, long at all. So they said the average person puts a brick there. I went, I'm not going to put a brick. I've got the uh, ability to do, you know, CNC'd stuff. Um, I'm going to make myself a form that I can just lay in and out. So I decided to go that way. The... Yeah. And that's kind of it at this point. At that point, I started to do something really important, which was to see how much the damn thing's going to cost. See, at this point, I haven't even decided I'm fully going to do it because I thought, well, if it's going to be three thousand dollars, I'm going to, yeah, let me think about this. But if it's going to be a thousand, yeah, I can do that. So at that point, I had fifty millimeters of hot face, forty-three bricks. Oh yeah, I'd already decided I was going to make those bricks, but later on, I they said no, no, just do them castables because it was cheaper. I'll show you why in a sec. Uh, One point eight meters of wool, so I can just grab a uh, circumference of that and then you know. Uh, times it by pi. 42 kilos of hot face, 18 liters of hot face. Uh, that's simply so I can work out um, just how much I needed to actually cast the damn thing, etc. So that allowed me to do er, this, a spreadsheet, which I love. So, oh yeah, wait a sec. When I looked at the dimensions, when I started putting together how much it would get hot rolled steel cut to shape with a laser cutter and everything, it was $150, $200. And when I saw the dimensions, I realized, oh, hang on, it was pretty much the size of a 44 gallon drum. So why don't I just use that, considering it's $5 to buy a, a 44 gallon drum? Compared to $200, and it's really not giving me much more. I think there was like a 5 mil difference in di in, um, in diameter, or oh, radius, so it's like a one, 1 centimeter. Who cares, right? I'll just slightly change it. And, I, and then I checked that out in Canada, it was the same. So this one here has the alteration to be that size, and I also made it slightly higher. Now, why would I make it slightly higher? It is because this This big baby here had about five millimeters clearance on the top. Now that would work, apart from one thing. When it gets really hot, things expand and shift and move, and, and I thought, why I give myself five millimeters clearance? Honestly, um, why? Because I want to honor this little creation I have of that uh, flu. And I thought, well, don't be silly, just give yourself some more. So I gave myself uh, five centimeters more, 50 millimeters. Hence, you can see the difference there. Not much. Um, and that seemed more appropriate. I also used a slightly larger amount of um, a larger burner pipe, only because I saw someone else do that and it worked out really well for them. But pretty much the rest is exactly the same. I also did a design for the lid. That's a little bit better. That needs a handle. I still haven't figured out how I'm going to do that, uh, but I will. And there we have it. So let's come back to the cost, the important bit.
so we have the steel for the pipe was fourteen dollars bargain the fittings and all the components for uh, a used oil burner a hundred dollars the light castable the stuff that goes to 1200 degrees celsius is was uh, 120 the wool was 140 damn it but you have to buy a full roll the heavy cast that goes to 1650 degrees celsius 3300 i believe um, was 132 and other bits and pieces of the metalwork was going to be 35 bucks uh, I'll show you that, like the stand where it's going to sit on and the lift, lid, uh, lift, lid lifting mechanism. So uh, that allowed me to calculate how many bags, for example, of the light cast. See, this is this is just at my computer without even actually um, going out there and having any experience. I had a gas regulator, forty dollars, um, because I I wanted something more than the barbecue, I needed more pressure. Uh, the oil container was $30, uh, that was an LP container from a, a car, believe it or not, you know, uh, in here in Victoria and Australia we have um, cars run on liquid petroleum gas, so that was 30 bucks off eBay. And the high tech bit of the whole thing, which is the, uh, le the temperature laser unit, which is basically an optical pyrometer, which allows you to do really accurate, well done smelts. Um, by cooking the damn thing right. So that was all that, as well as the slurry, which I have really good quality slurry. I'll do another video separately on that because um, it allows me to do the lost wax stuff really well. Fingerprint accuracy and just, ah, love it. Thousand bucks all together. How's that? Even I'm amazed by that. I didn't think I'd be able to do it. So, next on to, okay, lift the lid up. How are we going to do this now, right? Are we going to just um, uh, swing it left, right, all these other things like that? And eventually what I realized is that um, I needed to actually put together... Hang on, let me do this. I needed to put together how it was going to look in my workspace. Because as I went through the workflow for it, I thought, I'm going to have this sitting like that, then I'll lean over... Lift this, and if I lift this, it's going to cause a serious problem. I'm going to get the bottom side of the lid facing me while I'm lifting it, and that thing is damn hot, and it's going to radiate the hell out of me. Um, I don't really want to have an aluminium uh, metallized coat like I had when I was working as a chemist. That's a pain in the butt. Um, why don't I just swing it? So I decided to swing it that way. And I went, no, that's not working. I'm going to have something else nearby. Hang on, what, what am I doing? So the beauty of CAD is that I was able to do this. Uh, hang on. Just wait a sec. Uh, here... Where am I? Look at that. Huh? Love it. I can show myself what it's like to lead, uh, to move the lid. Now, what was also good is I realized, hey, this thing can swing freely here. I hadn't even thought of that. Hang on a sec. That's not great. Um, I don't want it to be kind of getting out of control. This thing is quite hot. Um, and just sitting there, anything nearby is getting irradiated, including that line that's down there, which is the gas line. Hmm, that's not great. So, at that point I realized I wanted to swing it out there. That was going to work the best. So as I did that, as I moved it, I realized, well, I'm also going to be sliding it um, on top of this. It's just literally going to be scraping all of that. What will that do from this side? That will fill my crucible full of crud. Oof. And I hadn't thought of that until I just maneuvered that round. So what happens a lot in engineering is you end up going, wait a second, I didn't realize that was going to be a problem. And halfway through the build, you then make alterations, which means that you end up having something that's bolt-on rather than designed for it. So you have to wait for version 2 rather than 
on the first one. So this is the next great little application in CAD. So just coming back to where that was. I then said, okay, pedal system. Let's lift the damn thing with a pedal down here. So at that point is when I thought, okay, you're nuts, right? You are not a mechanical engineer and putting things together like this, why are you going to such levels? Because I can. Uh, you know, I've got the tools, why not? So if I come here to, now to this point and I take it to the I end up having a look at why this can move the way it does. Now this shape is decided upon because it permits me to achieve the levels of range of motion. Now if you did not have that and you're going to try to put together a shape without knowing where it's going to move, you are screwed. You are basically making guesses and then getting the damn thing and shaving it down and, and maybe it's not even executable. This is the other element of design. You can actually move it around and see where it's going to be. The other one was, I actually had this as a flat surface. And I realized I had to make it round because as it moved up and up and down, I wanted it to just have just be touching. And the only way to do that, the only geometry that allows me to do that, was something round. Um, so I'm just having a look at the time, and it's getting kind of long. My wife is right. I crap on forever. Um, So it worked. So the lid system, and this is just basically pipe inside a pipe. So at that point I went, okay, I'm happy with that. I've got an entire workflow. I know I can actually use uh, this unit now to to heat my refractory coating that I put on my wax uh, components to actually then uh, cast them. I grabbed every single one of these uh, elements inside of them, measured them for weight, now I knew the weight, and I went, okay, I'll just make an angle iron base for it. Again, another mo a point where thinking through as a result of design, I went, well, if I put a square thing, that'll be easy to cut, and yeah, but then it's 120 kilos, roughly, because it'll be a few more with the crucible, on four points. And if you know anything about a 44-gallon drum, the rim takes a lot of the weight, so you know, 120 divided by 4, it's 30 kilos on a very tiny spot on a rim. That's not really healthy. So I thought, what if I make it 8 points, double them, uh, make it an octagon? I went, yep, let's do that. So I put together the materials of what that would take, like that. There's my big roll, by the way. Ta-da, of uh, wool. There's my template. For the pedal system, I was gonna whoop, I was gonna make uh, an interesting little pedal that looked like a dragon's tail, which more on that later. Um, and the angle line here. And the final element was, let's see what the octagon will look like. So it's basically being supported at these points. Dun, 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 dun. I didn't want it distorting in any way. So then I have this my final component, and I use that to create a template, a physical template, a one-to-one -one diagram through a printer, through a uh, application called Big Print, done by a particular gentleman on YouTube. I'll, I'll send a reference to that if you want to know um, down below how to, how to do it. And that allowed me to move on to the next stage. Wow, look, 28 minutes. Gee, she's so right. Oh, that's the reason why I married her. Um, okay, there's plenty more uh, in that. And um, if you want to ask questions about anything further about the design process, feel free. Remember, there's no such thing as a hater. There's only people that give you feedback with a bad attitude. So if you want to say, this all sucked, it was way too long and you're boring, I understand. Other people have said it before. Um, the next part is actually the fabrication of this and uh, the process I went through. Hopefully that'll be shorter. Uh, this is literally the most important process. That's why I spent the time on it. And the usual thing, rate, comment, subscribe, put down whatever you like. I do respond to people and I do answer email. Um, I've got no problem with that. Let me know what you liked. Anything else, talk to me. I'll respond. Um, have a great day, guys, and look out for my next video.
Thanks.